get the show on the road. Okay, welcome to our session today. We're delighted to have you here. Thanks for coming. Um, we're going to talk about DevOps, and before we get too far into this, I want to introduce our, our my co-speaker. Many of you know me, I'm sure. Carl Grant, I'm the Associate Dean and the Head of Knowledge Services at the uh, University of Oklahoma, Chief Technology Officer. So <clears throat> one of my superstars is, is right here, and if you've got this uh, issue of Library Journal from last month, with the movers and shakers, you'll see a very familiar face right there. So this is one of the 50 people selected from over 300 people around the country. Uh, and so I'm really thrilled for her. And so congratulations, Twy. <laughs> I love coming here and introducing a new mover and shaker. So um, I've had the joy of doing that three times out of the last four years. So we were doing pretty well in mentoring young people and bringing them along in our organization, and I'm really proud of that. So we're going to talk today about a number of topics. This is your first takeaway list. You get two in this session, one at the beginning, one at the end. Uh, first, we want to tell you a little bit about what DevOps consists of and the basics of its usage. And then we're going to talk to you about how we've applied it to library museum exhibitions, which uh, I think we will have some pretty good examples there for you to look at and see the advantage of using this kind of technique. And then we'll try and take some Q&A. And then as I warn Twyla, you're going to see a blur because my flight boards at 12 o'clock. Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to be tracking out of here. Twyla will answer questions. All right. So what is DevOps? A lot of people really don't know what that means. They hear the term. I've heard it several times in sessions throughout uh, this conference. But I'm not sure everybody knows what it means. And then what it's really talking about is the way you do your operations reliably and trying to make sure that they're reproducible and programmable. Because if you can do that, then you can write a program to do it for you, and that's what you really want. So if you're creating nodes in a hosting facility, we're all spinning up you know, modules and stacks in Amazon Web Services, or a lot of us are, and that's a totally automatable process. And so you know, rather than you know, creating a new stack and, and paying for it on a continuing basis, you can go in there, spin it up, run the task, run it with automated testing, utilities, take it down, shut off the billing, and you're, you're ready to go. And so it becomes a very efficient way of doing that kind of work. And so we're, we're increasingly doing that. So I like the line at the bottom there, if you're not writing software to manage these processes, you're not surviving. You're just building this quagmire of overhead that you're going to end up getting caught in. And that's something you can't do. So infrastructure has to be caught code. And infrastructure is not just software, it's hardware. The new system and has, you know, won't be powering down a machine. They replace a, are replacing a failing drive, reboot, all that usual routines. They'll write software to detect a misbehaving uh, EC2 instance, destroy the bad instance, spin up a new one and configure it all. No interruption in service. So that's where we're, you want to head, uh, obviously. And the implication here is that operations really becomes part of the development. This is where the DevOps name comes from because you're merging those two pieces together. And so the name DevOps comes from that intent. What, there's a, a number of books, and I'm listing them here on the left. I hope you're uh, capturing these. You'll get it from slides if not. But this one is actually a fictional work written about a DevOps story. And it's a fascinating book. And it's filled with... Um, it's filled with characters you will recognize. Uh, when I read it, I kind of put people's names next to the various characters in the book because I knew exactly who they were talking about in our opera, including myself. I, I, I found myself in there. Uh, Twyla, I asked her to do the same thing. We're going to compare notes when she gets done with reading the book. But it points out in this book that there's really four types of work that you're doing in your IT department today. 
And one's your business projects. These are new things that you're, you're planning to do um, and new projects you're creating. There's internal projects, overhead, maintenance, uh, those kind of things. Changes, you know, tweaks to, to the software that your users are asking for. And then there's unplanned work. Uh, which is where you kind of get slammed a lot of times with things you don't know that's coming at you, but you know, the provost office calls or the president's office calls or dean's office calls and says, I need you to do this. Okay, well, that's unplanned work and it's really kind of a big hit on your workflows. So well, we all deal with that. And the reality is we know that we have a small number of resources, people, machines, and processes that dictate the output of our IT flows and, and development workflows. And managing the, that is really important because that becomes your constraint. And that's where you have to really focus on implementing DevOps because it becomes your critical path for doing any kind of work. Whatever is the fastest you can push work through the constraint, that's the fastest you can do work. And that becomes a real challenge to deal with. So the way you manage the constraint, identify it. Um, we've done that in our operation. And you know, there's a couple of people. And if you read the Phoenix Project, you'll find that person in that book well identified. You'll recognize them when you read it. That everything has to funnel through in order to be touched, because they can fix anything. They're like the all-purpose, do it all. They know everything. But because they're doing it all manually, they actually become a very critical bottleneck in your process. And so this is, you know, the work they're doing is work you want to automate and try and get it off their desk so they can be focused in places where they can add real value. So basically what they're saying there is don't waste their time. Make sure you're not wasting their time. Subordinate the constraint to make sure that all the work arrives at the maximum rate they can handle if they're operating at the top efficiency in order to push it through and that'll be the flow that your system can maintain, your ability to take on new projects, uh, so on and so forth. So <clears throat> if you do this, if you put in these kind of uh, processes, then it enables faster release of new features, happier users, and increased employee productivity. And that's what we've tried to do in our shop. Um, now, we don't have this fully implemented. I'm not going to tell you that it's all there. In fact, we're going to show you an, one example where we couldn't do that, and we're going to show you one example where we did, and the difference it makes. So I think that will be pretty compelling for you to see. I also like this, uh, this explanation in the Phoenix Project, which is there are three ways things go through our departments, right? And the way you want to get it done is small batch sizes, continuous builds, integration, testing, and never making, sh and making sure you never pass defects along in the system. Uh, it's only, you want to keep everybody focused on what's the organizational goals? What are we trying to get done? The second way is a constant flow of fast feedback across all steps and a shared goals and a plan. So if you're getting all your team focused and the merged development operations together, these are the kind of things you're going to be working on. And then there's this idea of creating a culture of experimentation. It's OK to take risk. You know that you're going to have some failure. Um, there's no penalty in that as long as you learn from them and move forward. And repetition and practice are prerequisite for this to be mastered. And it does happen as you, as you allow for that. So at that point, I'm going to turn it over to Twyla and let her tell you what, what she's done with it. So I want to start by telling you a little bit about how we came to merge DevOps with our exhibit websites. Um, our flagship project for our exhibits program was called Galileo's World, and it contained over 300 items from his lifetime. And we realized very quickly that we had a real opportunity to not just build a companion site to this exhibit, but to build an experience for users. Um, and when I say we, I really mean an incredible group of colleagues, a very dedicated and inspiring curator. And so it took a lot of people to be able to do this. But what it did is it really shaped the way we um, approach <coughs> exhibits. So we knew we had this rich uh, resource of material. And what we wanted the user to experience was to be able to flip through a first edition Galileo work page by page, and then to zoom in to see the handwriting in the margin. And this, this again, this shaped how we approached exhibits to come. Um, and our first priority with our exhibit sites is to build engaging user experiences. 
We want users to interact with the material, and ultimately we want to drive them to our physical space to see these things in person. And so our exhibit websites really focus on having a one-to-one -one representation. If it's an exhibit item that's on physical display, we want it to be represented on the website as an individual item. Um, we want to have contextual rich taxonomies that link all these items together so that it's easier to browse and explore these exhibits. We want to have rich resources for them, uh, open educational resources, supplemental resources, so that this is not just a brochureware site, it's an experience they can come to and really learn about the topic. Open educational resources, which I mentioned. Um, but really, we saw this as an opportunity. It was going to be a big investment of time, and we wanted to make sure that we could capitalize on this in the future, that we could reuse code and architecture, and that we could build on this as each new exhibit site came up. And so the innovative piece was not just creating an innovative website, it was rethinking our approach to building websites altogether. So the first, before we get into this, the first thing I want to mention is that and DevOps is not a role that a single person or a unit does in your organization. It's a culture that you embrace. And it's not a tool that you purchase to do DevOps with. It's a methodology that you apply to the tools that you already have. And I say this because we, we apply it to web design in some really interesting and practical ways. Um, and what this lets us do is be, we, we gain a lot of benefits from this. We are scalable. So for my team, it doesn't matter if we have one exhibit item or a thousand. It lets us be efficient. We can upload hundreds of pages of content in minutes. It lets us be programmatic, so we try to automate our workflows wherever we can. And one of my favorite parts is it's reusable, which means the next time you approach an exhibit site, you can push some of the site development down to your non-technical staff members or maybe just other members on your team that are not your developers to set up these sites because these pieces are reusable. And that leads us to our, our most exciting benefit, which is innovation. So I went to the sun setting um, presentation yesterday. I don't know how many other people went to that, but I found it fascinating. I was excited to see that because they really highlighted how Slack time, creative time, helps your developers be innovative. And that's what we are really trying to focus on by applying this methodology to exhibits. So I have three practical applications for you. Content. This, for me, is the unsung hero, and it often is very overlooked, but it's where you can save hours and hours of time when you're developing your site. Um, our back-end processes, I have an example for you where we, were, where we were able to automate our digitization process. Again, hours and hours of loading objects manually into your repository. And then finally, our infrastructure. Now, we're not, like Carl said, completely to our vision. We just presented him with a new DevOps strategic vision for this year, and it includes many of the things we've already done and just enhancing them with these additional things, like automated development environments, code deploy, um, really thinking intentionally about our software developer lifecycle, testing, monitoring, and alerting. So I want to start with our first practical example, which is content. Um, again, it's, I feel like, one of the most powerful areas and one of the most overlooked when we're applying these DevOps methodologies. Um, it starts with structured content. Um, that's also called content modeling or content types. There's an entire profession around content strategy that we were able to pull from. And basically, it just means grouping content into a, a logical group and then breaking it down into its distinct and individual parts. Uh, I use events here because it's the most uh, accessible example I have, but we all know that there are certain ways to break down events. Events need a name, a description, a start time, an end time, a location. And so once you have your structured content, you can use a content gathering tool. And it doesn't have to be fancy. We use Google spreadsheets because they're collaborative, they're easy to use, and um, the, the columns become your data points and the rows become your individual pieces of content. 
So what this allows you to do is your curator, your subject expert, or your content specialist, whatever, whoever plays that role in your organization can go out and start working with your subject experts to gather this content. Um, at the same time that your developer, your database admin, your site builder is structuring your database to match these fields. And then at the very same time, your graphic designer, front end developer is creating a template based on these fields. All of this stuff can happen concurrently at the same time throughout the planning process. And then a month, a week before your site is ready to launch, you do a very simple content import. And it goes from the spreadsheet to the database and onto the website. And that's how we were able to um, populate Galileo's world with content so quickly. And I'll show you some more statistics on that a little bit later. So these are some reusable content types that we have built. Um, our import spreadsheets are already developed because we've already agreed on a lot of these fields. So they can be spun up very quickly by somebody who is not a content specialist or a database administrator used to start collecting content for an exhibit. Um, and every time we do a new site, we can add to this um, toolkit. Now, this is my second practical example for you. It's the way we were able to automate the um, loading of our digital content into our repository. So the blue arrows here are human processes. The green arrows are automated programmatic processes that we were able to build. And what we walk through here is an, an exhibit item is selected to, to be put in the physical exhibit. It moves on to digitization, where then it is enriched with metadata. In our instance, it goes to a local server where there is a directory using the Bagot protocol. I don't know if anyone's familiar from that. It's really used by Library of Congress. And it really, it's just a way to bundle disparate things like files and metadata and images together and transfer them along. So we transfer them from our local storage to Amazon Web Services using this protocol. And it ends up into a local infrastructure that we have built called our data catalog. And this allows our front end to switch out if we ever need to move our repository, it's going to stay in that data uh, catalog. We use the Celery Worker protocol to automate our tasks. So this is where the information goes from the data catalog into our Islandora repository, and then eventually onto our library website. Now you see that arrow right there is blue um, because we had some technology switch out, and so the next time we revisit this process, we will go and make sure that is automated. But what this does is it allows our uh, teams to really not care if your exhibit has one item or 100 items, as long as we give it enough time for those items to work through the workflow. It also reduces human error, as Carl was saying. That's one of the real benefits of the DevOps methodology in automating, is with 373 items in our exhibit, uh, there's a lot of human error when you're trying to upload things to a system. And then finally, our infrastructure. And this is something that we are still working on building, but I, I think the point here is that if you wanna be able to be innovative and to really push the boundaries every time you come up with a very exciting exhibit, you need to be able to reduce the amount of time that your developers spend on the fundamentals. So you want their code deployment to be lightning fast, their testing to be automated. You want them building things that they hand off to others to maintain or to set up the next time. Um, DevOps methodology combines that development process with the operations side of the house in this cohesive, continuous feedback loop. And I think this diagram really um, illustrates the fluidity of that process. So we have some um, tools just to give you an example of what we mean when we say DevOps. And I'm, I'm not gonna go into these um, in much detail because I feel like maybe that's a whole other talk. But just to show you that all of these are, are extremely important investments in your infrastructure to help reach these goals. So deep health check monitoring, um, rapid code production, the continuous integration platforms, these are some of the tools that you're gonna wanna be thinking about if you're going to move more and more into the DevOps methodology. And I think the point too is that this will not be accomplished by a single tool set. Really, it's a suite of tools 
um, that a, a DevOps engineer who understands both the operations side of the house, so your sysadmin skills, and who understands development can piece together a tool set that is right for you and your organization and your workflow. So that's the more traditional model of DevOps applied to our infrastructure. And most of these are open source. Right? Yes. So yeah, this is a combination of open source and paid um, third party paid vendors. And uh, this is part of our presentation that we did to Carl this year. So he could really understand where we were trying to get to. So now I want to compare two exhibits. One exhibit where we did use the DevOps methodology and how long it took and the investment of resources, and one exhibit where we were not able to. So like I mentioned earlier, um, Galileo's World uh, was designed to celebrate the 125th anniversary of OU. So it had some very big goals. It includes 20 exhibits at seven locations across three campuses. It has over 300 volumes from Galileo's lifetime, including works that contain his handwriting and signatures. These materials were digitized, given rich exhibit-related metadata. Um, they were embedded into the website using the Internet Archive Book Viewer um, so that you could flip page by page. And each exhibit item was given a rich narrative about why it was important to the exhibit. Like I said, we had a very inspiring curator who was able to pull all of this content together for us. The themes included every facet of scientific advancement, and it featured materials like rare books, but it also had scientific instrument replicas. Um, it had student projects, and we even uh, and digital resources, and there was even a 16-foot replica of the Leaning Tower of Pisa built for the lobby of our library. <laughs> it's very impressive. Um, it was supported by a lot of programs. So there were lectures, stargazing parties, presidential dream courses, documentaries. Um, the list just goes on a symposium. It was a very rich exhibit. And I, I tell you this because I just want you to get a sense of the colossalness of the exhibit that they were planning. Because really, we had a really big challenge to create a website that was going to do it justice. The website ended up being 640 total pages. Um, 20 of those were galleries. We had some sections. 373 was our final exhibit item count. 93 supplemental resources. It was supported by four taxonomies with 84 terms, anywhere from chronological period to subject to region. And just so we get a sense of an individual item page, it was supported with 20 content fields. Um, that includes citation information, location, where was it in the seven uh, location, three campuses, uh, subjects, exhibit metadata, and then of course the full text viewer where you could flip through the pages. So again, just a, a really colossal, robust site. The exhibit I'm going to compare it to is our Poetics of Invention exhibit, which came after Galileo's World. The big concept for the Poetics of Invention was to explore an idea as it was taken through the invention life cycle. We specifically used the invention of an OU professor who is not just a scholar, but also an innovator and an entrepreneur. Um, he created an invention that was a mobile app um, that makes English more accessible to the 350 million Chinese learners. And he did this by merging the world's two most spoken languages at the level of their phonetic DNA. Um, through the use of elocu elocution tables, poetry, and the development of a new alpha uh, alphabet. So it was a very rich content exhibit, but it was also a very small focused exhibit designed to serve as an interim while we worked on our next big project. So while the concept was very rich and bold, this was only on the main exhibit of our library's uh, main library location. Um, it was a single exhibit on one campus. And the total pages for the site, 135 pages. So that's a fraction of Galileo's world. It was one exhibit with eight rooms, 40 sections. It had 25 exhibit items. Now, if you remember, the other one had 373. Um, and one resource, even, at, oh, and zero taxonomies. 
even the content that we displayed per item was was just this again this is an interim exhibit so it was a couple of images and a couple of description fields so a much smaller exhibit website this is the fun part now we're going to compare what it took to build both of these sites, one using our DevOps methodology and one not. So Galileo's world started in December of 2014, and the physical exhibit opened in August of 2015, so an eight-month time span. And we finished the website on time, August of 2015. It took about an hour of content importing, and that was because we had more than one content import spreadsheet and we had some cleanup to do and we wanted to check through some things. Site building about 800 hours. Now, I know that seems like a long time, that spread out over eight months. And um, we did a splash, a small splash site to stand in place of the exhibit site so that marketing could start many months earlier. This includes planning meetings, 60 hours of theming, 20 hours of content input. Um, that would be things that were not included in the content import, like special customized pages. Poetics of Invention, on the other hand, started in May of 2017. The physical exhibit launched in September of 2017, but there were items still being done on the website in December of that same year. So that's eight months for Poetics of Invention. So the same time, even though the site was a fourth of the size we were not able to use uh, content imports, which I'll, I'll explain why in my next slide. So we were not able to use content imports. Site planning and building took about 200 hours. Uh, theming took about 100 hours. And content input is where we really took a hit, and that was 400 hours of content input. Um, whereas with Galileo's World, we were able to cr create pages in an hour, Poetics, and I, I cringe when I say this, every single page was made by hand. So why couldn't DevOps help the Poetics of Invention exhibit site? Um, well, first of all, we got our content in Photoshop files that were designed for murals and large panels. So the content had to be extracted, both English and Chinese. The images had to be extracted. They were optimized for um, print graphics, so then we had to scale them down. And this had to happen for every page we built. Um, content was not finalized until almost right before the exhibit opened. Some content was actually not provided to us until after the physical exhibit opened. Content was not structured for the web, meaning murals are very horizontal. Um, a web page is usually vertical. So it's, you have to rethink your design in order to translate those into a web page. Um, digitization did not go through an automated workflow, and that is because there wasn't any items to really digitize. We didn't get the content in early enough. Boutique photography was done after the items were in the display cases. Um, and we were not able to reuse much code or content types. There just wasn't the overlap. I think events might have been the only thing we reused. So ultimately, there was no automation. There was no scalability. There was no efficiency. It was a very eye-opening to collect these statistics for this presentation. I, I knew this. Obviously, it took eight months. But it wasn't until I started to really analyze it that I really understood the full weight of the example. So let me just interject there real quick. Part of what happened here is we had another large exhibit plan that we have been working on. And we finally came to a point where we said, this isn't, this isn't going to hit our goals. It's not achieving anything we wanted to achieve. So we yanked that one out. And then we were down to a few months to put in an entirely new exhibit because we knew we had to follow Galileo's world with something. So that was why we kind of turned to Twyla and said, you know, do what you can. Mm -hmm. Here's what we got to work with. Um, and so she should take more credit for working a minor miracle and still getting the website up and running for us. Yes, it was, yeah, it was a little bit of a shifting around in our exhibits calendar, yes. <laughs> so the reason DevOps made Galileo's World so successful is that, again, we were able to eliminate hundreds of hours of content entry. And again, I just want to emphasize, our curator worked tirelessly getting this content into the spreadsheet. 
automatic loading of digital items, reusable content types, again, these are things we've already talked about. These are just some of the, the ones that were very impactful for us. And then most importantly, teams were able to build separate pieces and in the end bring it together. Um, so for me, the takeaway is that you really have to start your planning and you have to think about this in a holistic way through your organization and you can't push these methodologies just down to your tech teams. It has to be something you embrace together and that when you apply these methodologies and you save your development team times, that is when they can be truly innovative. That's when they can take on a project like an interactive map or an interactive timeline or an automated workflow for digitization. And so that we want to protect that time from them and not have them spending their time doing routine fundamental tasks. Um, but I'm going to actually hand it off to Carl to do the final conclusion. All right, so the last things we hope you'll take away. As Twyla just said, plan before you build. By all means, don't learn from our mistake. Uh, you got to have that time. If you don't, you got a real problem. Merge your DevOps teams together. That is a, a takeaway here. Those teams need to become one, and they need to work in a continuous flow, as you saw in the diagram. Uh, and when that happens, they can all be working very much in parallel and achieving good things. Use tools. Uh, again, a lot of times I find developers all want to, you know, they want to tweak it and do it themselves. They need to use these tools. And so that takes some pushing and a bit of shoving to make that happen. Uh, but you can make it happen, and, and Twyla's done a very good job with that. Uh, look for those constraint processes, because that really does affect the entire flow and production capability of your organization. So when you find that constraint, look at what can be automated that 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 is flowing through that constraint person and try and get it automated so you can optimize their time. Do things programmatically. Re reuse and restructure code as well as content uh, and your systems and all of that has to be integrated together. I, I love, I mean, we used to spin up virtual machines all over the place and we'd leave them running for months uh, paying for them and then we finally had some, them open our eyes to DevOps being able to go in, spin it up, take it down, turn it off, and it saves you a lot of money, uh, which is great. And build for scalability, which is you know, what Twyla has done with Galileo's world, we will be able to reuse in future exhibits. And that's exactly what we've done. We've shown it can scale to very large scale. Uh, and we can develop more automated testing tools to put in front of that. We haven't done all of that yet, but that's all work that we're moving on. So I think we would say we are very much fans of DevOps. Uh, Twyla and, and her um, leader in the DevOps area is pointed out to me that we really shouldn't be calling any area DevOps because it is just a methodology and it really applies to more than just the hardware and the software. As she's showing here, we're using it on content. So the same benefits can be derived in a number of different areas if you think about it. The methodology works and if we apply it in more spots, then we can get more out of it. So it's not, not really, shouldn't be tied to an IT group necessarily. This is a, a methodology that I think has far wider applicability than, than we're thinking about. All right, so we got time for some questions as well, if you have.